Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn and co-founder of Segurate Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashawn. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And so this is a place that my ancestors have been since the beginning of time and this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. So um, I want to welcome everyone to our program tonight. Um, this is Darwin Month, and uh, we are so happy that you can join Rotary Nature Center friends in celebrating the life and contributions of the uh, greatest naturalist in the world. Um, Charles Darwin. And um, Charles Darwin's ev revolutionary insights frame our understandings of life today in all its aspects, and they continue to guide research into the complex, um, complex problems that we face today. Um, so um, we're really delighted that you can join us. Um, Charles Darwin was born on um, February 12th in 1809, the exact same date, and uh, and year as uh, President Abraham Lincoln. So um, we celebrate Darwin Day on um, President's Day as well. Um, so tonight um, we are honored to have as our featured speaker, uh, Frank Soloway, um, who is uh, an adjunct professor in the Department of Psychology at UC Berkeley and a Darwin scholar um, throughout his life. Um, he's uh, he got his uh, degree in the history of science from uh, Harvard University in 19, um, he got a PhD in 1978, but when he was an undergraduate, he attended a uh, seminar led by um, Edward O. Wilson. And in this seminar, he was inspired to study um, Darwin's life and, and, and particularly um, to study how he developed his theory of evolution and um, the importance of the Galapagos Islands. Um, he also met um, uh, and smire in uh, that seminar and both men um, continued to um, support him and um, talk to him throughout his life and uh, be mentors. So uh, for all of those of us, all those students out there, um, Frank's a senior thesis was about his ideas about Charles Darwin's um, uh, theories and about the Galapagos, um, for which he uh, received, um, he graduated um, summa cum laude from um, Harvard University for that work, um, started as a junior in college and continuing now throughout his lifetime. Um, Frank is uh, a recipient of a MacArthur Award um, and he's written books about um, family and personality. Um, about He has a book called Freud, Biologists of the Mind, um, and uh, one called um, uh, Born to Rebel, um, which is, uh, both of them are, are really excellent, um, fascinating reading. Um, he continues, Frank continues to do research in um, those areas. Uh, he's um, one of the, the wonderful attributes of Frank is how he includes um, students, um, even high school students in um, working on some of his research topics. And also he's brought teachers with him on research expeditions, including myself 
Um, so he's very generous and reaches out um, to wider audiences to, um, <clears throat> with his knowledge and, um, um, and so forth. So um, I wanted to um, mention that Frank is continuing to do research in the field in, um, in the Galapagos. And we'll hear a little bit during his talk about, about his most recent book um, called um, uh, Darwin and his Bears, um, which uh, has can be read on many levels. So um, at this point, I would like to um, welcome Frank uh, Soloway and um, turn him uh, turn our program over to him. Frank, are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, so. Um... Uh, I guess I'll start in. Um, as some of you may have known, I've, do, I've done a lot of research in the Galapagos over the years. Uh, uh, Katie was uh, referring to my, my undergraduate thesis at Harvard when I was a junior. I actually um, organized a film expedition as an undergraduate at Harvard and uh, took eight people around the South American continent. We went to the Galapagos and that was part of uh, the, the, the preparation I did for my senior research. That was uh, back more than 50 years ago. Um, when the Darwin Centennial came along in 2009, uh, I, I started to ask myself, gee, uh, what would Darwin like to know about all of the things we've learned about the Galapagos since his time? And I, I, I started to think that's a really interesting question because the things that would likely have interested him are not the things that we would immediately think would interest him. Um, for example, uh, yeah, um, Darwin, um, uh, if he had had a chance to present uh, a, a seventh new edition of The Origin, he would have faced more than 10,000 publications to try to sift through. And it would have been tempting for him um, to sort of to talk about the new species that he didn't know about. For example, he never collected a specimen of the flightless cormorant. Um, he didn't know at all about the uh, uh, Galapagos penguin. Uh, he surely would have been interested in the fact that there is a fourth species of mockingbird in the Galapagos. The mockingbirds were the first thing that really piqued his evolutionary interest when he was in the Galapagos. Um, he visited the, the, the first island, San Cristobal, and saw the mockingbirds you see at the top left. And notice there's, uh, the, they have a very white uh, breast. He then went to uh, Charles Island or Floriana where the mockingbird is really distinctly different. You don't really need to be an ornithologist to know that's probably a different species. Um, and then as he went to uh, other islands, uh, his curiosity was really peaked. So he made a real effort to collect more uh, mockingbird specimens. And these were in fact the only birds that he labeled by island. All the rest he thought, oh, well, it doesn't matter. And so he, he threw them all in one bag. Um, one of the uh, things that's important to uh, understand about how Darwin would have approached the, the evidence that we have about the Galapagos today is, is what was the structure, the, the, the sort of strategy of the origin? And I think Darwin would have, um, in a very selective way, have picked out from what we've learned um, those things that really, really would have bolstered the basic argument of the origin of species. So in order to understand what he would have uh, liked to have known about the Galapagos, you really need to know how he strategized that book, what, what the argument is. And the first of the, uh, the major arguments of the origin is that it's really a, an argument refuting the theory of creation by intelligent design. Um, the second of the major arguments that he makes in the origin is, of course, about natural selection, but he also has uh, an interesting discussion about sexual selection, which he later expanded on in Descent of Man. And then finally, um, Darwin made a very big deal in the origin of species about what he called his principle of divergence. He really saw it as a driver of, of evolution. And um, in a letter to his friend Joseph Hooker, he said, it, it along with natural selection, are the keystones of the, the whole book. So let's see how the, uh, what we know about the Galapagos today would have sort of um, piqued Darwin's interest in terms of these three basic arguments. Um, the, uh, the basic uh, 
uh, argument that Darwin takes on uh, this, uh, the arguments against creationism is really a running argument against William Paley's famous book, Natural Theology. Uh, so it's, a, it's an argument against the famous uh, uh, analogy that, that Paley had of, of the divine watchmaker. Paley's argument was, well, if you're walking across a heath and you found a watch on the ground, surely you would assume there had to be a watchmaker to make that watch. And when you look at all the marvelous adaptations of animals in nature, the same uh, conclusion should dawn on you. There has to be a maker of these exquisite uh, adapted organism, just like they had to be a maker of the watch. There are uh, uh, over a hundred references to the creator or creationism in the, uh, in the origin, almost all with Paley in mind. It's really the origin of species as a running diatribe about what's wrong with creationist theory and what's wrong with William Paley's own uh, argument. Uh, Darwin uh, actually had, it was sort of like a, a, a woman scorned. Um, uh, he, he had a, originally a, a, a marvelous love of Paley. Uh, as he said in his autobiography, I was, I was charmed and convinced by the long line of argumentation and um, uh, he practically memorized the book. Um, but in the origin, he, prov he provides what is really an astonishingly compelling uh, reply or refutation to Paley. And that argument is that natural selection will not produce absolute perfection. Uh, or, or as he says, nor do we always meet with this high standard under nature. In other words, if Paley was right, everything would be perfectly adapted. But if you really look around carefully, um, it, well, it's not exactly a mess, but, but from the from point of view of natural selection, um, things are only as, as adapted as they need to be under the circumstances. And so Darwin makes this argument over and over again. Uh, here he says, he who admits the doctrine of creation will have to admit that a sufficient uh, number of the best adapted species of animals and plants have not been created on oceanic islands for man has unintentionally stocked them with various sources far more fully and perfectly than has nature. And so in the origin of species, he actually uh, spends a huge amount of time um, uh, uh, marshalling the evidence of what has happened to various oceanic islands like New Zealand, St. Helena, uh, and Ascension after introduced species were uh, uh, made their way to the islands and basically wrecked havoc on the islands. So this was an argument if Paley was right, nothing should be able to invade those islands. But in fact, the, 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 the fact that these islands uh, are continually threatened and, and uh, um, undermined by, uh, by introduced species shows that they, they're just not perfectly adapted. Uh, the Galapagos is a, is a wonderful case in point. Darwin, in fact, was extremely interested in getting additional information about uh, invasions of the Galapagos. And in the 1860s, he actually heard somebody was going back to the Galapagos. And he said, oh, if you're going to go back, um, monitor all of the you know, new introduced plants that you can spot and see what havoc they're, uh, they're causing. Uh, and unfortunately, that, uh, that person didn't end up going, but Darwin uh, did his best to get the information. Here you can see uh, in the Galapagos, we have introduced rats, goats, uh, feral pigs, many, many other organisms. Cottony cushion scale, which was a, a, a terrible uh, pariah in the Galapagos until they, uh, out of necessity, had to introduce lady beetles to battle the cottony cushion scale. And of course, almost all this stuff comes in via uh, uh, ships that visit the island. Uh, now, with all of the tourism that goes on in the island, you have um, huge amounts of produce coming in. And, uh, and so the, the, the amount of, of introduced species has skyrocketed over time. When I first visited the Galapagos in the mid-1970s, uh, sorry, mid-1960s, there were only 60, uh, sorry, 70 introduced plants. And now uh, you can see there's, there's more than 750. So there has been an explosion of introduced plants and insects and so forth, all of which are um, Darwin would love to have written about uh, in, in terms of the argument he'd already made in the origin. Um, in this slide, you can see um, uh, the famous Galapagos tortoises, but in the background, you'll see a whole bunch of little sort of uh, um, speckly things, and uh, I'm gonna highlight them. This is a magnification of that part of the, of the photograph. There are hundreds of feral goats waiting to get where I am, which is, which is uh, where I'm standing, because that's where the water is. 
and um, they're sort of holding off until I and Mark Moffat, the National Geographic photographer, uh, left, and then they they, they uh, you know cruised into the to the to the area. Um, uh, I have used uh, over the years the the method of repeat photography to document some of these uh, ecological changes, and in particular those caused by um, overgrazing by feral goats. Uh, Feral goats invaded the, the volcano of Alcedo, which was isolated from um, other parts of the island of Isabella by a huge lava field. Uh, everybody thought the, the goats would never get across that lava field, but they did in the mid 1970s. And by the late uh, uh, 1990s, they had grown in, in size to uh, over 100,000 goats. Uh, this is a photograph on the, on the top left uh, that I took in 1970. And below it is a photograph I took in 2006. And I'm gonna show you what the, what the feral goats did to this particular uh, area. This is an enlargement of that first photograph and it shows a very thick forest of Xanthosylum fagera, which is cat's claw and other vegetation. And here's what it looked like in 2006. Virtually every single tree is gone. And that was uh, owing to basically the, the goats just ate everything in sight. And when they, um, you know, they, they eat through bark, they can they can knock down cacti, and they can basically eat it, virtually everything. This is another photograph that I took in 1970 on the rim of Alcedo, and you can see uh, uh, very lush uh, morning glories coating other other plants. And in the background, there's a there's a geyser that uh, uh, comes and goes over time. And here's a photograph of that area in 2006, and um, most of that vegetation is gone. This photograph, by the way, was taken in exactly the same place. So that dead tree that you see is the live tree that's on the photograph on the, on the left. And here's the close-up of the area of the geyser, again, that shows a, a great deal of denudation of, uh, of the area. This is a, a, a remarkable photograph that was taken by a Japanese botanist named Sayuzo Ito in 1970. And it shows uh, Xanthosylum fagera, the, the cat's claw, uh, still covering most of the summit area of the island of, of Santiago. What's interesting about this photograph, um, here's a comparison photograph from 2006, virtually all those trees are gone. But in the original photograph, you can actually see all the animals that are eating all the vegetation. There is a whole bunch of feral goats. And in this photograph, you see feral pigs. And in the upper right, there's a, a, a donkey. Um, and uh, uh, that's what happened to the vegetation. This is another photograph I took in 1970 on the island of Santa Cruz. Uh, it was taken on the, on the summit and it shows a, a fern and sedge belt through other uh, lovely uh, area. And um, by 2004, this entire area was covered with citrona or quinine, which had invaded uh, the islands, was introduced in the, the 1950s and just literally took over the entire highland area. Uh, so, um, what we see with uh, many of these ecological changes are um, uh, essentially uh, a, a kind of a, a variation on Darwin's famous metaphor of the entangled bank as, as exemplified in the origin by a very clever argument he had. Uh, he argued basically that cats determine the presence of red clover in many areas of England. And the argument was uh, that cats uh, eat mice, and the fewer field mice there are, then the fewer mice there are to destroy the, the nests of, of the humblebees. And the more um, humblebees you have, uh, the more pollination there is. But without the humblebees, you don't have pollination of red, cl uh, red clover. So um, lots of cats, and uh, um, you, you end up with, uh, with, with much, uh, much, much more uh, red clover. Uh, an ongoing example of Darwin's uh, entangled uh, bank met metaphor uh, is uh, the Apuntia loss on South Plaza Island. Katie and I have worked on this for uh, a number of years. And uh, I got interested in this project um, uh, after seeing this photograph taken um, by a famous uh, ornithologist um, in, in uh, Robert Bowman in 1967. And when I saw this photograph, I thought, gee, you could do a whole scientific project on this because he's, he's captured the entire half of the island of, of South Plaza. And we knew that cactus had been disappearing from this island. And, and based on this one photograph, there are about 300 cacti that are visible. 
you can actually monitor what, what happened if you can find other photographs or, or you know, take photographs over time, which I've done. I've gathered about uh, 2000 photographs from this island. This is a photograph that I took in 2014. And it doesn't look a lot different superficially uh, other than the fact that the, um, uh, the, the, the cactus are smaller in the original photograph and they're bigger in this photograph. But if you look carefully uh, at enlarged sections of these uh, photos, and you look in the far end of the island, and you look at other photos that were taken uh, uh, around the, these, these years, you can see that uh, the, the far end of the island had a huge cactus forest. And uh, about 13 of the 53 plants had already disappeared by 1968. But in later years, by 2013, all but three of them were gone. So the entire uh, forest on the end of the island has disappeared. And people were very uh, uh, worried about this and wondering what, what the hell is going on here. Uh, here's another photograph that uh, Bowman took on the other end of the island. And you can see I'm holding the, the actual photo in my hand and you can see what it looks like today. Virtually all the, the cacti are gone. So the average loss uh, of a puncha on South Plaza Island in the last half century uh, or more has been about 70%. And there are two uh, causes of this, uh, one of which is not uh, terribly sort of controversial. El Nino's, it's known, do destroy um, cacti. They get waterlogged. They take up too much water during El Nino's and they just fall over from their own weight. But the most striking finding uh, that we've made in this whole study is, uh, is not so much that cacti are dying. Cacti die all the time, but new cacti come along and replace them. In these old photographs that we have um, taken by Bob Moman, we cannot see a single new cactus in more than 60 years. There, the, the, there's simply no, um, no replacement going on. And the reason for that is the, uh, the, the fact that this island is inhabited by land iguanas, which uh, uh, are very um, uh, hungry uh, consumers of, of ca fallen cactus pads and also of fallen uh, cactus fruits. On an island without uh, land iguanas, both, of the, uh, both the cactus pads and the fruits are capable of, of rooting and becoming new plants. Um, so um, when you look at islands where there are no land iguanas, you find loads and loads of fallen clay toads and, and fruits. And on islands with land iguanas, you find almost none. When we were first doing research on, on South Plaza, we were monitoring um, the, the number of clay toads and fruits under cacti. We, we, we kept counting zero, 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 zero. Finally, we found a fruit and we were all going, hey, there's a fruit, we found a fruit here. And a, and a land iguana ran up and grabbed it and, and, and ate it. <laughs> right while we were, we were trying to figure out, do we count that or not? Um, so um, one of the things that you might think the, the, that the land iguanas could do that would be helpful is to distribute seeds around the island. In other words, they might actually, uh, by consuming all of these uh, uh, fruits and so forth, um, disperse the cacti and, 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 and cause uh, uh, new, new juveniles to occur. Uh, and here's a, one of the very few juveniles that's ever been found on the island. It has a, a tag that scientists put next to it because it was so unusual to, to encounter it. But the problem is that the land iguanas also eat the very baby cacti. Uh, in this photograph I took from 1970, you can see lots of juvenile cacti in the image. And then uh, this is photographs are taken from almost the same spot. And you can see there are absolutely no new ju juveniles and many of the older cacti have died out. And so the real problem is not the loss of cacti through old age or death or insect damage or whatever. It's simply that there was no uh, replacement of cacti going on. So what's going on? Well, the answer is this critter, the Galapagos hawk. Uh, the island of South Plaza is located about 400 meters from uh, the most inhabited island in the Galapagos, Santa Cruz, where the Charles Darwin Research Station is. And that island was settled in the 1920s. And by the, about the 1950s, it had a pretty good population of, of settlers. And one of the first things the settlers did was to kill off the Galapagos hawk because the hawk would come down and eat the, it, eat the chickens of the, of the settlers. Um, and so the, the island, um, the hawk was exterminated. And as a result of that, um, hawks we know are uh, very effective predators of both marine iguanas 
and land iguanas. Here's a land iguana that had been killed by a hawk um, and was later consumed by the hawk. And so what happened on South Plaza was uh, simply an overpopulation of the island by land iguanas and uh, the, the beginning of an, an ecological cascade. One of the reasons we really know that is going on is because there actually are a lot of juvenile cacti on the island, um, but um, you almost never see them unless you look over the, the steep cliff faces of the island. And there you can see they're growing um, in little crevices on, on the cliff face. Um, and so they're, uh, they're able to grow in places where the land iguanas simply can't reach them. And here's another example of that. This cactus actually managed to, um, to grow up as a, as a new cactus on the island. And the, the, the reason it was able to do so is it grew up through the middle of a, a plant called Galapagia castella, which is a very a thorny and prickly uh, bush cactus. And uh, when it was young, the, the land iguana simply couldn't get to it. And then finally, it sort of burst up and, and, and grew a bit more. But notice that a land iguana has actually crept up to one of the upper leaves and taken a big chunk out of it. So uh, it, it, the only reason it's surviving is it's gotten big enough to, um, to be able to tolerate that uh, uh, depredation. So we know from um, uh, population estimates that have been made uh, by James Gibbs and Howard Snell and others that the, uh, uh, the, the number of land iguanas on, on uh, the island of South, South, South Plaza is extraordinarily higher than elsewhere. You can see on Santa Fe, there's about a uh, little less than one iguana per hectare. And on South Plaza, there's 19 per hectare, which is a difference of 26 to, to one. So um, when, when uh, land iguanas are present, you don't tend to find, um, uh, any young cacti, and we were able to show that by, by going to different sites with and without uh, land iguanas and with and without hawks and so forth. Um, and, uh, and so it's a very, very clear uh, relationship. On South Plaza, if you actually sort of plot the distribution in, in height of cacti, you can actually see there's a gigantic gap between uh, essentially uh, tiny, tiny cacti and cacti that are over a meter tall. That gap is what should have been, been uh, filled during the last 50 years. And all of the cacti that are, that are larger than that are cacti that were, got their start before this problem um, occurred. Um, we were actually able on, on uh, South Plaza to do something quite interesting, which was to reconstruct the entire population distribution uh, or age distribution of the island back in uh, 1970 when we had uh, these early photos. Um, and the way you, you can do that is by uh, putting somebody in the distance with a meter stick, and then you can calibrate uh, from the meter stick and then the distance of the cacti from, from the camera, the actual height of every single image in, an, in a, every cacti in an old image. And so we were able to completely reconstruct the, um, uh, the age distribution of the cacti in 1970 on this island. And there you see that age structure. It's a fairly nice, uh, even age structure. This is what it looks like today. And again, you can see that gigantic gap um, that's caused by the, um, the ecological cascade that was uh, set in motion by the extermination of the Galapagos hawk. So just to, to, to sum up, um, the, the cascade started with the eradication of the hawk. Um, and then that led to a, an over uh, uh, population problem with the land iguanas on the island. That led to a massive reduction in recruitment. Uh, El Ninos didn't help the matter by, by eliminating uh, a lot of cacti, and then you have uh, the, the final uh, overall outcome. So uh, that's the kind of evidence that Darwin, I think, would have been really interested in uh, because it fits so perfectly with what he'd already argued in the origin about uh, New Zealand and St. Helena and uh, other oceanic islands. Uh, the, the second major idea that Darwin would have uh, been very eager to uh, gather bolstering evidence was for uh, the theory of natural selection as the primary mechanism of evolutionary change. And of course, uh, since Darwin's time, uh, the, the, the perhaps the most famous uh, exemplar of evolution in action has become Darwin's famous uh, finches. Um, which were uh, really made famous, not so much by Darwin, but by David Lack's book in 1947, in which he heroically measured 
every one of the 5,500 Darwin finches at the California Academy of Sciences and just showed statistically that they, they were such a wonderful case of, 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 of evolution uh, as you could prove by, by uh, the process of measuring them all and comparing island distributions and so forth. But since that time, uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant have done really a wonderful um, a longitudinal study over, over half a century of um, how beak shape changes year by year. And it turns out in this slide, you can see uh, the beak shapes uh, and body size shapes of uh, 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 one species of Darwin's finch, or actually I guess it's two here. Um, the yellow band shows you what the, uh, what the variation should be if, it, um, if, if it's not violating the sort of expected uh, trend by, uh, by, by, by statistical significance. In other words, anything outside that yellow band is a significant change from what was going on in previous, uh, in previous years. And you can see there's some uh, major deviations over time. Uh, the grants actually showed um, that in the early 1980s when a drought occurred, uh, that there was a huge increase in beak size in the in the medium ground finch, and this was due to the fact that uh, uh, the the finches during droughts preferentially eat all the easy seeds to crack open the uh, the smaller seeds, and by the end of the drought, the only seeds that were left in the soil were the ones that the the little the little birds with little beaks couldn't crack open, and they all died out. And that led to this uh, dramatic evolution in beak size. Once the drought was over, uh, then natural selection went back to work again in terms of selecting for efficiency of beak use. And it's you know it's great to have a beak, big beak when there's nothing but hard seeds around, but it's not a particularly efficient beak to use if there's a lot of small seeds around. And so natural selection readjusted things back down. Um, so I mentioned that Darwin was uh, very interested in, in, of course, sexual selection. Um, uh, he wrote in the origin, all those who have attend, attended this subject believe that there is the severest rivalry between males of the many species to attract by singing the females. Uh, I have not space here to enter on this subject, but of course he did um, expand on it dramatically later in The Descent of Man. Um, the Galapagos provides us with uh, some wonderful examples of the role of sexual selection. One of these is in the, uh, the tree finches uh, in the tree finches, the males, the older males are distinguished by a much darker coloration than the younger males. They reach a, a completely black coloration by about the fifth year. And it turns out that um, male color and mate choice are very closely related. Um, females are much more likely to choose an older, darker colored male. So the question is, well, why do they do that? It turns out that um, older males are much better at building nests and they're also better at building concealed nests. So females are mating with older males in order to, um, uh, and the males usually build the nest first in order to have a, a, a protected nest. And that, um, that leads to uh, uh, sexual selection for uh, mating success. Um, one of the, um, uh, so, the, and in fact, we know that mating uh, nesting uh, success is uh, directly related to uh, to the age of the birds. Now, there's been another yet another ecological cascade in the Galapagos caused by uh, an introduced species, um, a an ectoparasite called uh, uh, Pelornis downsi, um, and it's impacted into this um, sexual selection story in a very interesting way. So here you see. What, what I've already been talked about, uh, the question of uh, males being chosen early uh, and being chosen by, uh, if they're older and that leading to nesting success. Um, and uh, it also turns out that older males are successful in nesting because they prefer to nest close to other bird nests. And this is a mechanism that allows uh, for, for example, if, if a hawk comes around and, um, uh, and you're near another nest, you hear the warning call of the other species. So there's an adaptive advantage to nesting in groups. Unfortunately, with the introduction of Pelornis downsi, uh, the benefit of nesting success that came from nesting in groups was com has completely backfired because the fly is able, once it detects one nest, to detect them all. And so um, 
the, the level of, of Falornis uh, in, uh, infestation intensity is directly proportional to the number of nests uh, that are in a, a bird's neighborhood. Um, the, uh, for those of you who don't know much about Falornis downs eye, it is a very insidious uh, ectoparasite. The, uh, the female fly lays uh, the eggs in the nostrils of the baby birds in the nest. And they work their way up into the into the nostrils and, and eat the keratinous uh, material, um, completely deforming the beak in many cases. So the birds don't have an effective uh, um, a bird song, for example, and, and that causes problems with uh, members of their own species recognizing them. It also causes weakness in the beak. Um, but even worse than that, when the uh, uh, the larvae get a little bigger, they go down to the bottom of the nest and they come up every night and they suck the blood of the, the fledgling birds, um, of the baby birds. And we now know that uh, between 50 and 100% of all Darwin's finches are killed in the nest by Falornis downs eye at the moment. It's one of the most serious threats uh, to bird life uh, in, in the Galapagos. Uh, I did a, a study with uh, uh, Sonia Klondorfer where we actually went to the California Academy and measured um, all of the uh, thousands of finch specimens that they have there. And because the finch specimens before 1962 have no nares deformation, the, the nares or the, uh, the nostril hole there, uh, we were able to show that the introduction of the parasite occurred sometime after 1962, uh, probably in some um, shipload of produce that came out from, from Ecuador. Okay, so this brings us to Darwin's uh, third uh, sort of um, pet idea in the origin of species, his so-called principle of divergence, um, which he saw as basically driving the process of adaptive radiation and which, as I mentioned before, he called a keystone of the book along with the theory of natural selection. It's interesting that the, uh, the theory of adaptive radiation or, or uh, Darwin's principle of divergence. It's the only topic in the origin to which Darwin devotes a figure. There's just one figure in the book, and this is his illustration of how the principle of divergence uh, works. <clears throat> so the um, uh, the principle of divergence explains um, uh, adaptive radiation, and it also explains a phenomenon known as character displacement. And I will uh, talk a little bit about that. Here you see, of course, Darwin's finches are a beautiful example of adaptive radiation. We now know from, um, from genetic testing that many of the uh, radiated forms that were once given the same species name are actually quite genetically different. They just have converged on the same beak shape, but often inhabit uh, different islands. So uh, the, the two species there in blue were, were, have long been called by the same name, but they're completely different species. And the warbler finch, um, which is the closest to the ancestral form of Darwin's finches, uh, turns out it split apart into two species about one and a half million years ago. And the two forms are almost identical visually. And so ornithologists had confused them until the genetic testing revealed that they were what we call cryptic or, or sibling species. But this is a, a, a classic case, case of adaptive radiation. And adaptive radiation occurs through a process of, of what's called character displacement. And the Galapagos finches are just a wonderful example of that. Um, in this uh, instance, you can see the small ground finch, Geospiza phylogenosa, that has a smaller bill than the medium ground finch. And that's the way you see it on, on most islands. But there is a natural experiment in the Galapagos um, on the island of Daphne Major, uh, only one species of uh, these two ground finches exists. And you can see that it's moved back into the sort of middle ground. Uh, and we call that character release. There's, no, there's nothing pushing it uh, away from, from um, uh, another, another species niche. And on Los Hermonas Islands, only the small ground finch uh, exists. And it has moved upwards in bill size through natural selection to take advantage of the fact that the uh, the, the middle, the, the medium ground finch isn't there to push it around, so to speak. Um, I think Darwin would have been um, most interested in something that almost nobody ever uh, sees or pays attention to in the Galapagos, and that is the Bolimulus land snails. They are the champion speciator in the Galapagos. They've evolved more than 80 different species and subspecies, uh, many of, of which has, have still not even received a name. And unfortunately, owing to uh, the introduction of um, 
um, uh, of other species, upwards of a, a half of the Bulimia species are now, um, now extinct or threatened. Uh, Darwin's interest in land snails uh, comes from uh, his interest in, in refuting uh, the theory of creation. Um, he, he realized that uh, land snails are killed by salt water. And so the problem is how do you get in an evolutionary world, how do you get land snails to an oceanic island? Well, he spent more than a year conducting uh, experiments uh, trying to uh, you know, soak land snails in salt water. And the problem was every time he did it, they all died. Uh, he was uh, uh, sort of uh, almost despaired of, of the situation because it was such an important argument uh, for a, a naturalistic origin to land snails, which are found on virtually every oceanic, uh, every oceanic island. He finally discovered something that we, of course, now know, and that is that land snails hibernate, or what we call estivate, um, at, at various times. They seal off the, the aperture um, with a kind of a glue-like substance, and they can actually survive for a year or two under those circumstances. And once Darwin realized that, um, he then soaked uh, uh, estivating snails in, in salt water and, and found they could survive for several weeks under those conditions. And he makes a big deal out of this in the, in the Origin of Species as, as, uh, as proving an argument that uh, his critics had, uh, had thought was fatal to his theory. Um, so here is a, a, an actual um, uh, uh, evolutionary uh, diagram of, of the land snails. And once again, just like the finches, um, genetic testing has now shown that many species of land snails that had received the same name are actually quite genetically different and have just converged on the same um, uh, appearance of, of, of carapace shape. And the basic principles of carapace shape in the, in the Galapagos, I think would have interested it, uh, Darwin. Um, the, the land snails um, uh, vary in, in shape between globular, globular shapes that you see on the right and very sort of spindly shapes that you see on the left. And the spindly shape uh, uh, land snails uh, 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 dominate the lowlands where it is arid and where the, the, uh, the, the adaptive uh, secret is conserving um, moisture. And so they have um, maximized the, the overall shape of the, uh, and size of the shell relative to the open aperture. And in the highlands, that's not so much of a problem. And so uh, you have a much larger um, aperture there. Um, Christine Parent actually did a, a, a wonderful study using, um, using X-ray techniques. And she found that uh, one particular species over a distance of only 200 meters in elevation um, had noticeable um, uh, natural selection effects. Uh, about every 10 meters, you could detect um, the effects of natural selection in, in um, either elongating or in compressing uh, the overall carapace shape. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the, the land snails are highly endangered now. And uh, as you can see in this illustration, uh, the, the level of endangerment is exactly proportional to the number of introduced plant species, which in turn is probably proportional to the number of introduced everything in the Galapagos, uh, some of which uh, is, is just not good for, for land snails. So um, one, um, uh, one last idea that I think Darwin would have uh, really been interested in, um, in incorporating into, into the origin um, was a thing that's been called his, his uh, naturalization hypothesis. Uh, he argued that, that a, um, a, a new species uh, is much more likely to be naturalized if they're in a genus that is different from the, the genera that are already present in some locality. And his, his argument was simply, if they're in a different genus, they don't compete. They're, they're different enough that um, th they should be able to get a foothold. Um, a study was done recently of New Zealand plants by uh, Duncan and Wilson Beard and, and Williams, Beard in Nature. And they found exactly the opposite. As you can see, the expectation uh, uh, in, the, in the orange line is that um, the number of uh, naturalized species will go down with uh, the number of, of, of native species in the same genus. But in fact, what, uh, what uh, Duncan and Williams found was the opposite. Um, I got interested in this problem with a, with a, a, a Galapagos botanist, man named Chris Budenhagen, and we, we re-examined their data 
to see whether maybe there wasn't more to Darwin's hypothesis than um, uh, Duncan and Williams were giving him credit. So we analyzed the data from New Zealand. And what we found is if, if you look at it carefully and look at the log of the number of species in the genus, um, yes, at first, um, th that trend goes upwards. The, the, the more species you have in the genus, then the more naturalized species you have. And that's due to a phenomenon known as pre-adaptation. Think of it this way. Um, if you're trying to get a foothold in the Galapagos in the lowlands, where it's just lava, um, you would do well to be a cactus, even if there are a lot of other cactus there, because if you're a succulent plant, you're probably going to have trouble. So uh, pre-adapted plants do quite well um, in getting a first foothold. The problem is that as the number of, pre of, 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 of colonists in that category builds up, they eventually start comp competing with one another. And that's where Darwin's hypothesis uh, actually starts to kick in. So here we uh, did the same analysis for uh, Galapagos plants. And you can see that uh, um, early on uh, where uh, there are only a few, a few species in the same genus, uh, Darwin's hypothesis seems to be wrong. But once the number begins to really accumulate, then Darwin's hypothesis kicks in and the competition um, limits the number of new species that can um, arrive and successfully uh, be colonized in the same species. And it's actually quite proportional to um, the level of pre-adaptation. Pre the higher the level of pre-adaptation, pre the more uh, Darwin's hypothesis appears to be violated. But then once you reach a saturation point, the more Darwin's hypothesis appears to be confirmed. Uh, whereas with low pre-adaptation cases, it doesn't uh, look as impressive. So uh, let me just uh, uh, conclude here uh, with a wonderful quote that Darwin uh, uh, wrote uh, in a letter to Joseph Hooker, the Galapagos seems a perennial source of new things. He really had a lifelong fascination with the Galapagos and uh, he used the Galapagos in many interesting ways in his origin argument. Um, and, in, and in some ways, um, uh, in ways we, we would not have expected, for example, there is no mention of Darwin's finches in the, in the uh, origin of species. Um, that's a, sort of another story, but, um, um, but I think um, uh, he, he, he made about the best case he could have made of the Galapagos, precisely because the, the origin of species was so well crafted as an argument. Uh, his argument against creationism, his argument for natural selection and his supporting principle of divergence are really um, master, masterful uh, ways of presenting the theory. And uh, the Galapagos helped him to make those arguments, but it would have done um, even more for him today if he could have known what we know. So thank you very much. Thank you, Frank. That was um, really impressive. So many, so many things. And I saw some um, in interesting questions coming up in the uh, chat are you um so i'm asking people to raise their hand if you have a question and my helpers in chat if you could identify some uh, questions um that we could ask frank andrew alden has a has his hand up in a question cool uh go ahead andrew can you um, sorry is Sorry, I was just applauding. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> awesome. Um, Keep it up. <laughs> I noted um, one question. I didn't get the name of the person. They were talking about um, the um, when um, looking at the costs and benefits of um, clumping together in the um, nesting birds. Um, when they clump together, there's an increased cost um, of parasitism by thornus of the nest. Um, is there any relationship in uh, for individual males or females, I guess, in being able to secure extra pair matings in clusters? Has that been looked at? Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think we know the answer to that. So um, buy your buy your plane ticket and head to the uh -huh. Galapagos. What a wonderful <laughs> research uh, project that would be. Ah, oh, we have some great questions out here. Um, let's see, Renee asked if you had any thoughts about how uh, natural selection might be applied to um, Lake Merritt in Oakland. Um, I, uh, well, I don't, I, I don't know all that much about 
Lake Merritt in, in Oakland, but I can say this with um, uh, absolute confidence that every little critter living in Lake Merritt is being subject to natural selection uh, in, the, in the same way that uh, uh, we see natural selection going on today with the COVID epidemic and uh, variants outbreeding other variants and so forth. Natural selection is just, uh, it's everywhere. And um, um, it, it's often hard to see. That's one of the great virtues of the, the grants year by year study of beak size in, in Darwin's finches. No, no, before that study, nobody would have dreamed that you could actually monitor natural selection over a two or three year period. And, and uh, now, now, of course, as partly as a result of that work, um, we, we see natural selection going on all the time from year to year. So uh, anybody can go out to Lake Merritt today and monitor something that's going on now and come back a year later and show that natural, natural selection has affected the population density of some species or other. Um, and, and so many invasions of uh, uh, critters from other places have come to Lake Merritt. It's a really interesting place to look at um, how those have fared um, in relation to Darwin's ideas as well. Uh, we had a question from Miriam, um, and she asked um, what measures are being taken to protect the, um, the Galapagos Islands from um, the invasive species? Well, the, there, there's a whole uh, um, elaborate program of quarantines and um, inspections that are done in the Galapagos uh, to prevent the introduction of new species. But I, I have to confess, it's a little bit too little too late. It was, this program was only really only instituted in the 1990s, by which time massive destruction had already gone on. And um, even though they've, they've vastly cut down on the number of um, introduced species that come in, they still come in. There's no way you can have a cargo boat come out to the Galapagos with you know, all sorts of produce being unloaded, you know, cartloads of bananas and so forth. They're gonna be you know, insects in, in that stuff. And uh, so uh, it's, it's, a, um, it's a kind of a losing battle as Darwin understood in the origin. Oceanic islands are enormously vulnerable to um, to extinction uh, by by introduced species, so um, it costs a lot of money to tr even just to slow that process down. Uh, reverse it? No, that'll never happen. We have some great questions here. Um, let's see, okay. Um, what is being done to control the goats and other or other agricultural animals? Um, well, the the uh, the control of goats in the Galapagos is one of the uh, the big success stories. Um, uh, you often hear, um, you know, for every success story in the Galapagos, there's like there's like ten non-success stories, but the the conservation people love to tout the ones that are very very visible, and goats are very visible. Um, in the 1990s, uh, the National Park mounted a, a, a very systematic campaign of shooting feral goats from helicopters. They hired sharpshooters from New Zealand and they killed uh, uh, somewhere on the order of two or 300,000 goats uh, on the islands of Santiago and uh, uh, Alcedo Volcano, where I showed you some of the photographs. The elimination of feral goats from Santiago and also feral pigs was the largest land mass on earth from which a quadruped, feral quadruped had ever successfully been eliminated. And this is quite extraordinary uh, when you understand how bad the terrain is on this, uh, those islands. It is a spine filled, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, thorny uh, tangled vegetation and to actually be able to spot all of those, you know, introduced feral animals and, and effectively kill them was an incredible uh, accomplishment. And it was done um, uh, after uh, the use of helicopters. They had uh, hunters go in with, with trained hunting dogs. And because the terrain was so bad, all the hunting dogs had to wear little booties to protect their, uh, their feet. But anyway, they, th that was a great success story. And let's see. Um, so, uh, Tony says that today in Wired Magazine, 
Amit uh, Kadwala has an article about a new database revealing how much humans are messing with evolution. A very interesting article about how climate change as well as human activity is influencing evolution today. Um, you, um, I guess the, 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 could you expand on that? Uh, we talk about the invasions and, and their consequences over uh, quite a number of years in the Galapagos, but do you have any thoughts about the general um, messing up of um, evolutionary processes? Um, well, I yeah, I mean, um, Tony's absolutely right. And then the, the author of the article, uh, I haven't read it, but it's absolutely right. When you, when you think about it, if, if you have areas that are warming, um, species that are already there that are used to um, a cooler climate are going to be displaced by other species moving into their, uh, into their territory um, uh, that, that is more adapted for uh, a warmer climate. And so you have massive displacement going on among various species around the world. And for some of them, there's sort of no other place to go. So um, this, is, this is the kind of um, um, you know, rapid evolutionary change that we've seen in the past during periods of glaciation, for example. But their species have the time to, to adapt over you know, 10,000 years or 100,000 years. We're, we're now talking about just a couple of hundred years in which species are just being faced with um, um, totally disruptive climatic uh, uh, circumstances. Yeah, that was the uh, gist of the article that evolutionary changes are occurring a lot faster now than when Darwin, you know, uh, was looking at them. And, uh, but the interesting part is the human activity that they were talking, he talked about where, uh, you know, that, that can have a, uh, a significant effect on, on species changing. And one, one example was just, uh, you know, in Africa where they, they killed the elephants, you know, for the tusk that at, at a certain point, uh, there aren't any elephants with tusks to breed. And so you're getting a change in, in a species uh, as a result of that. So yeah. it, it's an interesting article to look at. And, and then they also talked about a database uh, that exists that has about 20,000 species in it that a lot of researchers are using to, uh, you know, again, look at uh, changes in evolution. Yeah, yeah, interesting, yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, K K Katie oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Dr. Uh, Silouet, I would like to check and see if we didn't miss a question from uh, Jerry Lips that go follows along the lines of, uh, We've looked at microorganisms at Lake Merritt, and a problem is that the disturbance is continuous. And um, where did it go here? Now it's jumped. Yeah, and the disturbance is continual and ongoing. Everything changes every so often, even daily. Yeah, that's, yes. uh, uh, you know, the, the more you know and the more information you have, the more the tangled web that Darwin describes in the origin, uh, you know, just it emerges and shows you how interrelated everything is. So you, you, well, you disturb disturb one thing, you disturb everything along in this in the chain. Yeah, we're not done with the study yet, but it looks like the uh, uh, the more restricted species in terms of their environmental needs are the ones that are eliminated by all of that change so that you end up with very flexible populations of things that can even get by even when they dredge the lake every so often. But it's, well, a, it's not a good place. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, uh, very Jerry, fun. that's an interesting uh, point. We need to segue now, it's eight o'clock, and yeah. we need to segue into our uh, question uh, well, to end this meeting and then move on to those that can stick around for some brief questions and answers. And uh, I'd like to continue that thought because we have some upcoming dredging uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers in the Port of Oakland to widen the Oakland estuary. So if we can come back to that, that'll be great. I'll hang okay. around. I am, hope you can stay, yes. So um, we're going to uh, pause here real briefly. I hope everybody can stay and just give a, a few credits. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, hopefully with success. 
um, and just um, take about five minutes to, to do that. Light. All right. And hopefully we will be seeing this. Okay, so uh, again, um, happy Darwin Day to everyone. Thank you so much, um, Frank Soloway, for uh, joining us tonight with um, so many uh, fascinating details about what Darwin might have wanted to know if he were alive today, including his origin of species. Uh, if people are interested in investigating Dr. Soloway's book, um, Darwin and His Bears, um, I have the uh, website there for you to take a look. Um, it's a very interesting book and a good review of a lot of evolutionary theory um, over the last several decades. Um, we'd like to thank our, um, our producer, uh, Rob Lamone, um, and our um, co-chairs and staff here that um, are working on Lakeside Chats. Um, we want to make a special thank you to the um, uh, San Francisco Elks um, Lodge um, awarded us a Beacon Grant in 2022. And uh, thank you to the Lake Merritt Institute um, for collaborating with us on so many things. Uh, we're grateful to all of our generous donors. Um, and thank you. Uh, we also have um, partners that we'd like to acknowledge. I think it's half second to scan this one. Um, couldn't uh, continue our work without uh, all of these people. Um, if you enjoyed the Lakeside Chat and if you visit our website and are um, supportive of the kinds of you know, in-person and activities we do with young people at Lake Merritt and would like to support us, um, here is our uh, uh, PO box. And if you would like, you can make a donation to Rotary Nature Center Friends. We are now a 501c3. Uh, our Lakeside Chats are also rebroadcast um, on uh, the city of Oakland um, TV station on uh, KTOP. And you can tune in there by going to the website, the Oakland website and finding the link. Um, and thank you for coming everybody. Um, we will take just a brief moment um, and I'll stop sharing my screen. And then uh, Dr. Solway, can you stay for a few more minutes to talk sure. to people? Yeah. Awesome, okay. I'm going to stop sharing and saying thank you so much, everyone. Okay. Um, Katie, I had a couple of brief questions. Yes. Uh, my forgive me book, uh, doctor. One is that um, in my um, mind, Santiago, Chile comes up as a landlocked area, but sometimes it, it, when uh, in ref, uh, references to Darwin, it seems to be mentioned as a, a island in the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. Is that? Yeah, well, uh, San, Santiago is one of the Spanish names given to uh, the islands in the Galapagos and is a very different place from Santiago, Chile, which as you note is landlocked indeed. Uh, Darwin visited both of them. Uh, he spent time in Chile uh, uh, in the fourth year of the voyage and um, uh, uh, did a lot of geologic work in the Andes um, and then um, uh, sailed to uh, the Galapagos about three or four months later. Uh, interestingly, in his time um, on the Beagle, they used English names for all of the islands. So he, did, he never used the, the name Santiago. Uh, instead, he called that James Island after King James. Uh, so, uh, and the, the English names were pretty much used by all scientists up through the 1960s um, until Ecuador really began to develop the national park. And it became a kind of a matter of courtesy to switch over to the Spanish names since uh, the, they, were, they were now sort of running the show. And so now um, the islands are all uh, referred to by their Spanish names. Oh, thank you. By the way, Darwin um, uh, spent uh, eight days camped on Santiago. So that was the island where he actually spent the most amount of time in the Galapagos. Oh, great. Another interesting note there. Hmm. He accomplished an awful lot and didn't spend very much time at all in the Galapagos. What was it, uh, Frank, 17 days? 
Uh, it was about 35 days total, but he only spent about 17 days on land, I think. Um, yeah, right. And, and uh, part of the time the Beagle was dr drifting around. Yeah, right? I mean, but he, he always spent about half of his time getting from one place to another. Uh, so considering how much time he had on land, he did a, a, a rather astonishing job. The, the number of pages of notes that he took in the Galapagos is, is really quite extraordinary. It's uh, uh, well over uh, 100 pages in geology and, and uh, uh, you know, his meticulousness in, in recording every single specimen, whether it was a geological specimen or a zoological specimen, um, is really uh, is really quite impress impressive. I and mean, he must have spent when he was back on the Beagle. He spent a lot of time uh, writing up notes and and uh, uh, skinning specimens and and uh, tagging specimens and recording them in his specimen notebook. So he was a busy guy. Apparently, between bouts of throwing up. Yeah. <laughs> um. So Frank, uh, so one of our uh, one of our listeners wants to know where um, where Darwin's uh, actual notebooks are now. Um, how are they being preserved, and uh, who gets to look at them, and so forth? Uh, some of the notebooks from the Beagle Voyage are at Down House, which you can visit as a um, a, as a tourist if you go to England. So about a an hour's train ride and sort of bus ride from London, so it's not not too hard to reach. Mm -hmm. Um, other of the notebooks are at Cambridge University Library, and um, if you pre present reasonable credentials, you can go and, and look, for example, at Darwin's species notebooks, which he opened immediately after becoming an evolutionist and began to write out all sorts of um, hypotheses about how evolution works and thoughts about uh, um, whatever he was reading at the time and how it would enter into an evolutionary argument. The, the notebooks are absolutely fascinating. Those notebooks have virtually all been published. So um, you can, you can um, go on the internet and just put in Darwin and notebooks and you'll get, you, you'll get yourself to uh, the published source of virtually every notebook Darwin ever wrote. The Darwin industry has done an incredible job of, of um, um, writing about every piece of paper Darwin ever left behind him. Let's see. Do I have a question there, Katie? There is a question about the pig and, uh, and goat removal and wondering whether it was a, a study then about the response of the flora and fauna after the goats and pigs were taken out. Yeah, the, 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 the National Park has um, has rather assiduously monitored the return of vegetation. Um, and there's a, a lot of research that, go, that goes on now um, about uh, uh, all of the conservation efforts. For, for example, um, they reintroduced uh, tortoises to the island of, uh, of Pinta where they had, where the last tortoise died, uh, so-called Lonesome George, but they reintroduced uh, sterilized tortoises because tortoises are ecological engineers. They reshape the environment in very dramatic ways. They distribute seeds all over the place. And so if you don't have tortoises on an island, the whole uh, ecology of the vegetation changes. And um, so now they're, they're actually monitoring. They have um, satellite markers on these uh, tortoises and they can observe them from space where, where they're going. It's quite, it's quite in interesting to go online and see what a tortoise did yesterday. <laughs> um, but they use all of that uh, data in, in ongoing research studies. One of the things that always impressed me about Darwin and his, and his work was the level of uh, meticulousness and detail that um, he brought to it and, and shared. But to hear you talk about the limited number of days that he spent there, what it was 17 maybe, um, really even expands what I was already in awe of. And I wonder, uh, was he singular in that sense or could we think that uh, men of means would have been coming out of Cambridge at the time, uh, you know, across the board or in general applied that level of, uh, of uh, academic uh, study to- Yeah, my- 
my sense is that um, Darwin was a, a workaholic. Um, I mean, we know this from after the Beagle voyage. He, he, he got up every day and, and just the number of letters that he wrote to people to get information is extraordinary. His correspondence has, has been published over the last uh, 30 years or so. It's now, his correspondence is 30 volumes. And, you know, he, he would write uh, a thousand word letter to somebody and then turn around and write another thousand word letter to somebody else all in the same day. Uh, and do that day after day after day. And that was just his correspondence. Then, then there's all the publications he's working on. He was um, very meticulous. He kept uh, uh, very uh, accurate records of all the experiments that he did. Most people don't realize what an inveterate experimentary was. The Origin of Species is filled with information about experiments. And we have those notebooks in which he recorded all the details of the experiments. And, and when you look over that, you see just how careful he is, how, how much detail he records. So he was a detail guy and he was a workaholic and he loved his work. And uh, I do not think that the average student who went to Cambridge University with him was anything like him. <laughs> <laughs> and he published a lot of books. Yeah. Uh, he yeah, published was... 16 or 17 major yeah. books and yeah, uh, probably more than 100 articles. And these were long books. You know, many of them are two volumes. And well, I, imagine, I imagine on top of the time it takes to write the book, you got to have the time to uh, come up with what you're going to put in the book in the first place. So, yeah, that helps. As much, yes. <laughs> so, but, you know, I, I asked the question in reference to the challenge, or maybe not, and I don't mean that necessarily in a totally negative way, the opportunity that we have before us to try to create uh, environmental stewards for the future. And, you know, what is, it, what is it gonna take to create a Darwin or, or you know, and, and Darwin's and Darwin, Darwinists uh, for the future. So that was the vein that comes up. Yeah, I, I mean, I do think that uh, uh, people like Darwin come along um, you know, all the time, and if they're given the opportunity and, and can get themselves, for example, into graduate school, uh, there are a lot of very, very dedicated people who do research in, in um, you know, biology today, and um, they may not uh, achieve the fame that Darwin did. Darwin, in some respects, was lucky in that, um, uh, you know, he came along at a time when evolution was not the dominant theory, and he, he was exposed to just the right information to become an evolutionist, and then had, in a sense, an open field ahead of him to enunciate a scientific revolution. Um, if he had been born 20 years later, uh, somebody else would have uh, 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 announced that theory, Alfred Russell Wallace would have, and we wouldn't view Darwin as, as being as famous as he is today. We, we certainly would have viewed him as being a a major scientist of the 19th century, but um, the, f the fact that he um, had the good fortune to be alive at just the point when evolution was not accepted and to make it acceptable uh, was something that uh, catapulted his, his career into the stratosphere. Hmm. A little tricky there. <laughs> when, when we think about the, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the modern climate and uh, climate change, well, climate change, and I don't know if we can actually call it a debate, but uh, some of the things that have come up in our current times regarding that. Along those lines, David, uh, one of uh, uh, Dick Bailey was asking about what might, um, what characteristics of organisms might affect their ability to respond um, and adapt to climate change and other human caused um, changes. I don't know if you have some thoughts about rates of evolution and what um, I think the way he put it was how fast can um, different species adapt to climate change and should there be a ranking based on the, uh, does it depend, for example, on their rate of reproduction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, the, I mean, Jer Lips touched on this topic when he was talking about uh, uh, some of the studies that are going on in Lake Merritt. I mean, you have uh, sometimes generalist species that do quite well, and then other species that are more, have a, a more narrow niche that, that get into trouble. But the, the problem you really face is that the, 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 the generalists and the specialists are all part of an integrated ecosystem. And so if you lose the specialists, um, 
you can't just say, well, okay, they were just specialists. They don't, they don't matter that much. They're part of that whole chain and you've now disrupted the chain. So it's a very complicated uh, process uh, to, you know, to, to have even a single species in a web, an ecological web or network uh, be disturbed. Oh, wait, I'm just... is that you, Dick? No, it's me, Jerry. Go ahead, Jerry. I was just going to say that um, we tend to think of these um, webs and eco ecosystems as rather permanent and they're dynamic. They're changing all the time. And one of the things that I am quite curious about the Galapagos and started to work on is sea level changes and what that impact would have. Because uh, just 13,000 years ago, sea level was 400 feet below what it is today. There was a lot of exposure of islands and connections between them because they were closer together or even connected. And that might be a more normal situation since these high levels of sea, where we see them today, there's only two of them in the last 200,000 years. And most of the time sea level has been lower than it is now, but not as low as 400 feet. Hmm. And that ended with sea level rising to 4,000, uh, I mean, to present day sea level 4,000 years ago, roughly. And that's, so, so we're looking at the Galapagos and the actual islands themselves are only 4,000 years old the way we see them. Yeah, when you look at a map of the Galapagos when the sea level was 400 feet lower, it's a real eye opener. I mean, there are, there are islands that are separated that are now connected and it just is, it looks like a wholly different place. Oh, I got distracted looking at people wishing me a happy birthday. It's, happy birthday. Uh, <laughs> yeah, happy no, birthday. No, 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 wait. No, it's my, it was my mother's birthday. Oh, well, happy oh, mother, it's... happy your mother's birthday. <laughs> she, she turned 80 yesterday. Uh, well, and also the same month of Darwin's birth, birthday yeah. as well. Almost the same day. <laughs> really? Uh, the 12th. Well, Jerry, you gave you something a second ago. I just got to say what you mentioned, what, uh, What's a normal uh, situation when we're talking about evolution uh, and how things evolve? So it's kind of, that's all gonna have to be relative. But, um, and then uh, uh, Dr. Sulaway, you mentioned the, a generalist species versus a specialist species. And my same question, like I just said to uh, Jerry, how are you gonna have a generalist species when we're talking about evolution? Whatever it is, it adapted to uh, fit that its own environment. So, and it's even got the word species in it, which is sort of a subset of specialists. So how do you get from generalist species to specialist species? Well, what the generalists think? the generalists have a wider toleration for things. And what we see in Lake Merritt is things come in and they're specialized on one thing or another, and then they leave or are driven out by one thing or another. But the generalists live on because they can tolerate a wide range of things. And that's a specialization on generality. So would that relate to the, the number of things that a, a, species, a species was about? So one species might be about 12 things, whereas another one might be about two or three, and that one would be more specialized. That's one way to look at it, yeah. Yeah, Usually just think, by habitat or food type, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Just think in terms of the, the breadth of diet. If you have a very narrow diet and, and what you eat dies out, you're in trouble. But if you eat a lot of different things, well, you're, you're maybe in better shape. Down to fundamentals. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I had a question earlier that I don't think we'll see in the chat. Um, would it be all right to ask that now? Absolutely. Yes, please. Okay. Um, oh, I think a really good example of a generalist, by the way, is crows. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Because uh, you. Well, I'm sorry. Do you mind before your question telling me how so? Um, well, so cities are you know growing in size, and we're not you know the dominant. I mean, they're still not the dominant landmass, but <laughs> um, thankfully, but. Um, 
that uh, larger and larger areas are becoming places where you have, um, so I work as a landscaper, um, you have a really wide variety of introduced plants. Um, you mostly have concrete. You don't have a lot of other animals running around except for things that are also scavenger type animals. And you have a lot of human made trash. You have compost bins and um, people also not composting, putting it just in the trash. Um, and so uh, a species like crows is, is very able to, um, uh, through its brain power, through its size, through its ability to fly, through all these different sort of characteristics, it can deal with the variability of that environment at the same time that there's absolutely totally crows in completely rural areas that have absolutely nothing to do with people and they live off of things like pine nuts as opposed to you know the, the KFC that somebody dropped. Um, and so that's something that's it's a it's it's a you know it's it's specialized in being a generalist and being adaptable or something like um, what are those little birds that live in the Pacific Northwest and they're they're a seabird but they only nest in the tops of trees and old growth forests. Um, and so with all the logging that's happened historically, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting the species name, but with all the logging that, because it's specialized to this one single type of very difficult to recreate uh, environment for its nesting sites, where like, I don't know, have you seen like rock pigeons just any little nook or cranny, that bird will go in and build a nest there. It has no problem um, being flexible. Where, um, yeah, I don't remember what it is, but um, I can look it up. I'll look it up after this. Yeah, so a number of people in the chat saying it's marble mer mer merlet. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, marble merlet. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, their numbers are plummeting because of their their specialization in one type of very specific nesting site. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Oh yeah, no problem. Okay, and now on to your question. If you still remember. I hope um, you still remember. Uh, was it, so was it? Oh yeah, so I said I work as a landscaper. And so there's um, sort of an argument in terms of people who work with um, like drought tolerant or and especially native plant landscaping where uh, I've heard people claim that we need to bring in um, plants from Southern California and plants from like say Arizona or New Mexico that will, um, because the climate is changing and, and, uh, and we need to do things that take a lot less water. And to me, that seems um, short-sighted because if we're protecting the space that, um, or even replanting, like using our gardens as individual small plots of new open space, um, where we help, uh, you know, if we're collecting seed locally, then we're actually expanding the locally adapted gene pool into a physically larger area. So if we are protecting uh, locally adapted species, native species, then I think with a larger population, you're more likely to have that like, uh, you know, every population goes, change fluctuates over time, but to have a population managed to not completely crash as climate changes that I think bringing in um, plants from elsewhere that might be pre-adapted, I was unfamiliar with that term and um, so thank you, that, that's new to me, um, might create just in, in additional invasive species whereas um, working with, uh, with what's already here and just allowing it to adapt to the changes over time through natural selection, um, we're going to forgive, able forgive to me, TP. I, I, I think I hear your question in there. I want to allow. Yeah. You. We only have a couple of uh, minutes left, uh, uh, Dr. Sulaway, uh, uh, an opportunity to respond, perhaps. If he yeah, just what do you think of that whole that whole that. concept in terms yes, of yes, uh, what yes. we landscape with? Yeah, well, I, I I'm with you on this one. I uh, it's it's really a question of do do you want to um, speed up climate change or do you want to do something to kind of give give the the local flora and fauna a break and encourage, and encourage its uh, uh, preservation. And uh, it makes more sense to me to do the latter. Um, as you were talking, I, I was sort of thinking Darwin would have loved what you just said because um, one of his um, uh, big ideas in, in the origin was that a larger population is always more successful because 
it has more opportunity to produce new mutations yeah. that will be the raw material for natural selection. So just the fact that you, that you support a population or increase it in size or maintain it in size um, allows the, the species themselves to, to help themselves yeah. um, by, 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 by adapting. Yeah. And so th that's another little feature that most people wouldn't have thought of, but Darwin would have. He would have immediately picked up on what you were saying and said, yes, that's in my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for telling me that. I really appreciate it. Thank you for another, your question. Another, con Great. another concern might be um, instead of bringing, well, if you're going to bring things from Arizona or Southern California in here, then you ought to catch a bunch of the things that are here and take them up north where they will survive. So that it's not just a replacement of the things that are here, those things also have a chance. That's not evolution though, that's just ecology. Yeah. <laughs> Which I, I is important. About, I worry about uh, people becoming blind, uh, blinded by, by the concept of climate change when, um, when working with plants, there's soil type, there's the aspect of how the, um, there's local pollinators. There's, so it's so intertwined that just worrying about, hey, is it going to get too hot is too simple. Um, yeah, that's my thought. Well, thank you. This is such a rich uh, conversation. I'll tell you, we're so lucky to have uh, Dr. Sulaway join us. And uh, I know one for, I have a thousand more questions and we could just go <laughs> on and on. However, it is uh, just at 830 which is the time that we uh, need to end our lakeside chats. So uh, I'm gonna let Katie uh, do our official closing. And I just wanna thank everybody for joining us. And thank you for the presentation, Dr. Sulaway. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Dr. Sulaway. Thank you everyone for great questions. Um,